since you're much quicker to fly it down than high school students. <laughs> so thank you. My name is Patsy Hicks, and I'm Director of Education here at the Museum of Art. And on behalf of myself and my colleague, Julie Joyce, Curator of Contemporary Art, we'd like to welcome you to the second in the series of Parallel Stories. A recent addition to the museum's diverse programming, Parallel Stories pairs art and artists with award-winning authors and performers of regional, national, and international acclaim, functioning as a multidisciplinary lens through which to view the museum's collection and special exhibitions, and as a springboard for thoughtful conversation. To aid in that thoughtful conversation, I'm going to ask you to please make sure you've turned off your cell phones. And I apologize for people having to move in, but it is always human nature to fill the outside first and the inside last. We'll be talking about that later. Um, the Spring and Summer 2016 inaugural series focuses on artists and writers reacting to art or the art making process. Beginning last month with Julie's Curator's Choice, which featured Charles Long and Jonathan Latham, and continuing very happily today with Louis DeSoto and Pico Iyer. Artist Louis DeSoto grew up in San Bernardino, California, and received a Master of Fine Arts from Claremont Graduate School in 1981 after receiving a BA in Studio Art with a minor in Religious Studies at the University of California, Riverside. He has taught in San Francisco State University since 1988. Although raised Catholic, Lewis has been a student of Buddhism for more than 30 years. And in his thought-provoking piece, Para Nirvana, Self-Portrait, commissioned by Julie and this museum, and currently on view in Ludington Court, he raises questions of mindful breath, the cycle of life, death, and rebirth, spirituality, consciousness, and loss. With roots in India, the UK, and the US, Chronicler of the Global Soul, Pico Iyer, often returns to Santa Barbara and to our good fortune to SBMA. Called by NPR's Krista Tippett, the translator of the modern rediscovery of inner life, he has written over a dozen books, including The Global Journey of the 14th Dalai Lama and most recently, The Art of Stillness, Adventures in Going Nowhere. Just as DeSoto's Para Nirvana invites us to consider the dualities inherent in a work both large scale and literally light as air, massive and ephemeral, so too does Pico's writing become a guide to both our external world, travel, and our internal journey. He reminds us of the luxury of simplicity. We have invited them and we invite them to the stage today to discuss these intersections informally and formed in part by your own questions. Please join me in welcoming as they touch on mind-raging topics, perhaps including Buddhism, fathers and sons, and how stillness complements movement in the creative process, whatever the form. Join me in welcoming Louis DeSoto. Thank you, and thank you all for uh, giving up this radiant uh, Sunday afternoon to come and join us inside. Uh, I was lucky enough actually to sit in on the first uh, conversation that Patsy was just describing with Charles Long and Jonathan Lethem. And uh, of course they're both brilliant artists, but I think part of the fascination of that event was that they're old friends and they've actually collaborated. Uh, and I think part of the fascination of today is that Lewis and I have never met until 30 minutes ago, so <laughs> we really do have a lot of questions we want to ask each other. Um, and yet, you know, part of the magic of circumstance is that quite a few years ago, we ended up working on the same exhibition. Uh, it was called The Missing Piece in honor of the 14th Dalai Lama, and 80 artists were asked to contribute to pieces, and Lewis was one of them and traveled around the world with, with them. Uh, and I wrote a piece for the catalogue. And in fact, Lewis, while traveling with that event, 
met my wife twice, but never met me. We've spoken on the phone exactly once. But uh, all of you are probably familiar enough with the San Fernando Valley to know that uh, the Soto Avenue and Pico Boulevard are not far away. <laughs> <laughs> right now you're joking, but we will be speaking about that. Honestly, we're going to be coming back to our names. But um, the natural place to begin, of course, is with this piece, and I hope all of you have seen it in the museum. <clears throat> and when I called up Lewis a few weeks ago, I was remembering how for the Dalai Lama's exhibition, you did a Paro Nirvana, but it was very different from this. So can you tell us a little bit about the history of that and of this? Oh, sure, sure. Um, the piece that was in the uh, Missing Peace Show was the second uh, inflatable Buddha that I had made. And uh, I tend to wander a lot when I work, meaning that it's hard for me to stick to series. And so when I was going to make another one, I decided to change the color. And those of you who've seen the image of the Buddha know that there's Buddhas of immense variety and colors and so on. So I, I moved on to a blue Buddha. And uh, I also did that in terms of the way I thought about the Dalai Lama, uh, which is a, a, an image of a peace. And so I wanted a more ephemeral, uh, floating feeling from that particular Buddha. So when uh, I worked with this company in San Diego, I, I went to the painter, whose um, uh, his name is Hai Nguyen, and he is a Buddhist from from uh, uh, from Vietnam, and he is the airbrush painter that I work with. So um, I explained to him what I wanted, and he did a few samples, and we got a nice almost out of focus effect with that one. Uh, and uh, that's the one that traveled in the, in, in the Missing Peace Show. And that was the first such part of the That was the second one. The first one uh, mimicked the stonework of the Sri Lanka uh, Buddha that I modeled it after. So the first one is uh, brown with uh, yellow and uh, uh, dark highlights, so it looks more like granite. <coughs> And I'm guessing something in your life must have moved you to start making that. Right, right. In 1998, uh, my father passed away. I was actually at that very moment, and it seems so strange to me now to say this because it sounds like some fanciful fiction, but I was with my friend Don. We were on our way to New Mexico, and we were driving uh, into Death Valley. And at that moment, the sun was going down, and it was throwing a gigantic shadow of our pickup truck across the valley. It was a huge shadow. We were completely amazed by it. And then that was the moment that my father passed away. And uh, uh, we stayed in Las Vegas that night, and I called uh, home to San Francisco. And uh, the woman that was staying in my house uh, feeding my cat she said, you have to call home right now. And I, I talked to my mother and my father had passed away. He had uh, uh, basically uh, passed away in his chair, television on. Uh, nobody was aware that he was deathly ill. Um, he told my mother a few minutes before she went to take a shower that uh, he said, uh, honey, I don't think I'm going to make it. And uh, she came out and he had passed. And uh, when I went home, uh, instead of feeling incredibly sad, that night I slept on the floor uh, in the living room. And uh, I had this vision of myself from above. Um, and uh, it was this feeling of pride. And it wasn't my pride, I think it was my father's pride. Uh, and so I started thinking about this idea of what, how would I meet my death? How, you know, when you're not in a hospital surrounded by your family, watching this happen, uh, and it happens in a mysterious kind of vacant way, like I'm hundreds of miles away, unaware, having uh, an amazing time with my friend. Um, I kept thinking about images of death and religion. Uh, we have lots of torture, lots of uh, uh, agonizing deaths in Christian uh, imagery. 
And, um, I, and I thought of the, the Buddha uh, on his deathbed preaching the teachings of the, the last few moments of his life uh, and passing into what's called the Parinibbana, which is the total extinction. Uh, and uh, I thought, what, what am I going to do? How am I going to meet that situation? And my, my best hope would be a, a Parinibbana, a great passing into Nirvana, but probably not an extinction. I think I'm due for a, a few more thousand cycles, karma-wise. <laughs> uh, so um, that's, that's what I decided to do, was allow myself to see myself at that moment. And also realize that we have so many memories in our lives that are somatic, that are based on our body, the feelings in our body. But death is not one of them. It's the big one that's not there. We can't remember dying over and over again. So it seemed to me that the image had to be empty of some, of some sort. And I came to this idea of the inflatable for that reason, because it's, a, it's, it's, it's large. Right? But it's also, it weighs hardly anything, and it, without the air in it, if you rolled it up, anybody in this room could pick it up and walk out with it. <laughs> so that, that, that emptiness was important to think about in terms of like a somatic feeling. There's no weight to this idea of death, except for the fear. Yeah, yeah full of emptiness, emptiness is full of basic Buddhist idea, I guess. Right, right. Um, and for any of you who hasn't done it yet, I've done it twice in the last few days. Please go at 10 minutes before the museum closes every night, which is usually 4.50, and see how this piece, which is wonderful, already comes to life when it's dying, as it were. I mean, the process of watching it deflate is very, very moving. And actually seeing somebody kind of climb into non-existence, yes, I mean, You know, that really wasn't my idea. Terry <laughs> <laughs> Dempsey, who runs the Museum of Contemporary Religion, Art in uh, St. Louis. He loved he, the, he loved the sculpture deflating, and he would just unplug it whatever chance he had. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said, Terry, we have to like have a little bit of discipline here, and let's let's Terry, let's allow it to inflate after the museum opens and let it deflate with the museum opens, so that it doesn't become a kind of uh, I don't know kind of like a a fun show, a side, show, a side show thing. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of emotion as you actually see the process yes, of transformation yeah. and, and impermanence and fluidity and all that. And as I understand it, para nirvana or pari nirvana, the classic term, mm -hmm. means ultimate consciousness. Is that right? And 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 extinction from the uh, cycle of the reincarnation. Yes. Mm -hmm. And para nirvana, which you coined, probably means almost. Or, or great, a great nirvana, you know, something larger, something that's beyond uh, the experience of nirvana, uh, because it's an empty concept again. So that's why I use it. And have all the you've done four nirvana? Four. They've all had your face. They've all had my face. Yes. Do your friends recognize you? When they yes, some, some recognize. Somebody uh, here in the crowd said that somebody recognized me from seeing the piece in another city. Ah. <laughs> so they seem kind of other yeah, Yes, in another, in another time. Because of course, most people, unless they have a visual sense of you, wouldn't know that's you. No. And they might take it for the Buddha, which is nice. That's, well, we all have Buddha nature, supposedly. <laughs> so anybody yeah. could be up there, if you yeah. like. <laughs> no, well, and I was assuming that's why you put the non-Buddha face. But, um, and also, I've always imagined that the mark of a Buddha it's somebody to see the Buddha in a book, to see that, mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. image. So it's an exercise for the, for the viewer as well. You've never been to Sri Lanka to see the original. No, I haven't. So how did you, just photographs? And just photographs. In fact, um, uh, I found a classic photo of it in a, uh, you know, in a, in a Buddhist art uh, book. Uh, and then uh, I started going online on it. I would just key in that. that particular place, and I got hundreds and hundreds of pictures of it from all different angles. So I just printed out all these pictures of it and brought it to the company, and that's how we got the 3D portion of it finished. 
I used the original photo from the art book to, uh, like this to Photoshop, I put my face on it and uh, uh, kind of keyed that in and that's what they used as the model for the head. And then uh, for the robe lines and all those other things were from all of these photos, basically tourist photos that have been put on people's websites and yeah. blogs and so on. Yeah. So we get to see the feed and the back and we're able to fill in all the different uh, angles. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, one of the things I was thinking about when I saw it, Patsy was mentioning that um, I wrote a book on Ketonius. And eight straight Novembers recently, uh, my wife and I got to travel across Japan right next to the Dalai Lama with his bodyguards and his private secretaries. So we would have lunch with him every day and we'd attend all his private meetings and we'd also, with all his public events, but also we'd sit in on all his private meetings every day, day after day. And one thing that really struck me about that was he never takes a break. From the time he leaves his hotel room at 8.30 in the morning to when he returns at 4.30 in the afternoon, People will say, do you want to catch your breath? Do you want to just have 10 minutes quietly? He said, no, I want to be absolutely present to everybody, every minute. But one always has a sense that when he retreats into his hotel room at 4.30, he's like your piece here. He's <laughs> collecting things and he goes back into it. And then in the morning, we're always aware that he wakes up every morning at 3.30 and meditates for four hours. And it's almost as if he's like your piece here. Getting out again. But I was thinking of, it's also reminded me of breathing in and breathing out and the kind of inflations and deflations we all go through. And all of that must have been keeping that in your mind. Oh, sure. I was also, I had done a project about uh, using uh, plants as imagery and thinking about how plants, and if we look at plants, particularly flowers, they look like fireworks. You know, there's this kind of explosion in the center. And uh, I've always been fascinated with the, with the issue of time in photography. So the idea was that somehow I could portray the plant as, uh, as a firework, to show uh, that, in fact, its time, time code or its co cognition of time, if it was the same as ours, we would no humans would appear anywhere because we move too fast. Uh, it's like a long exposure with a, a, a lens open at night. You can walk in front of the camera, cut back and forth across it, and then you won't appear on the film. So the idea was that these plants would, in a sense, be radiating, exploding all around like fireworks, and that somehow we need to be able to see the two types of time code together. So one part of the image has got a kind of smeary, uh, uh, blurred quality, and the other part's very, very sharp. Mm -hmm. So I tend to think about that, I, I thought about that in this, in that it's like one breath slowed down, uh, like a Bill Viola video, yeah. where, you know, something takes hours and hours to manifest itself, that takes only a, a few seconds. Yes. And it's interesting you mentioned Bill Viola, because I was thinking a lot about him, and he, he also comes from this Buddhist practice, doesn't he? And one thing I love, about when I read up a little bit about your earlier years, the fact that you first got into Buddhism when you were in college and you walked into a class to study drafting because you were going to be an architect and it turned out to be a philosophy class. Right, so. right. <laughs> um, yeah, I was, uh, I, I really wanted to be an architect from a young age and I, I worshipped uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and uh, I would check out all his books and I would make uh, scale model drawings of his designs, and uh, so that's that's what I wanted to do. And I uh, took a class at the junior college in drafting. Very, this was my first foray into becoming an architect. And there was this big guy uh, uh, prancing back and forth in front of the class, and he was asking his questions like, "What is the good? Why should we care? Uh, and, uh, what is what is death? You know, what what is uh, all of these sort of primary questions that uh, that were never really asked in my Catholic catechism. Um, and uh, uh, I just sat down and I didn't think about it as a mistake. I thought this was okay. This is it. Real this is what I this is what I really need to know. And uh, I, uh, given his passion to. I think that it wasn't just the subject, but it was his passion for letting us know that people have been thinking about these questions thousands of years. 
and there's, vari there's variations on the answer, and each one of these variations has its own weight and use in our lives. So I just, I just went nuts for it. And um, by the time I was uh, into Nietzsche and Hegel, I started taking uh, comparative religion classes. And I saw a kind of logic in Buddhism that uh, didn't appear to me in uh, my study of other religions. That is, it seemed to be more like a science, that it was based on experience. And this experience was borne out by practice. And if you did these things, these things happened to happen. And that then led you to the conclusion that, you know, X, Y, and Z, all these various things lined up very well. And so I, I switched to religious studies and uh, worked with uh, Francis Cook, who wrote some, uh, a couple of very wonderful books about Dogen Zenji. Mm -hmm. And uh, that kind of got me on the, the Buddhism track for a while. Mm -hmm. And then I, again, wandered off <laughs> into art and wound up uh, trying to be a painter. But not for good, I mean, you still, do you still have a Buddhist practice? Or? I, I have uh, kind of reawakened that as of recently. Um, in fact, uh, Pico, your book, your latest book, is one of the reasons I got back into meditating again. Um, and I actually, it was odd because I was, something about reading a book and uh, thinking about the nature of thought and the way I thought about it before, let's say that I'm 22 years old and I'm trying to meditate. So what I'm trying to do basically is control my thoughts. You know, saying, oh, there goes another thought, damn those thoughts. <laughs> um, and um, uh, why can't I concentrate better? What's wrong with me? I'll never do well at this, that sort of thing. Uh, but I was thinking about this uh, figure-ground relationship idea. You know, the people have seen this before, that there's a, a goblet, right? And then you see two faces. And then you see the goblet and two faces. You can't really see them together. If you see them together, they become an abstract mishmash. They're unreadable. And I realized that my thoughts were more like words on a page. And then if I thought about the paper, then the relationship between the thoughts and stillness was more balanced. And then I realized that the paper needs the thoughts and the thoughts need the, the, the words need the paper. So they weren't, one wasn't supposed to be expelled, which is, I, I think that comes from my Catholic background in relationship to ideas about purity. You know, like if you want to purify yourself, you have to remove all sin, right? Everything has to be expunged. Uh, and then I realized, well, actually, that's not what sitting's about at all. And that it's actually more about the idea of this balance between seeing that thoughts need the silence and vice versa to, in order to coexist. Mm. Just yesterday, I read a beautiful sentence from, I think, one of the great Buddhist artists of the 20th century, John Cage. And he said just what you said. He said, I want to be awakened to real life rather than saved from it. Uh -huh. In other words, the salvation is what I'm doing today, right, right. which you know goes right back to to my own mother. Uh, so now you have a you maintain by yourself a kind of sitting practice. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to be a lamp to myself. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing Flash I mean, <laughs> exactly that's the Californian version. I guess because one of the things I love is I think you said that driving can be a form of meditation. And Definitely driving is and driving is a huge part of your life, but also your art. Driving is an art form, right? Right, and and automobiles as sculpture too, is, and what they automobiles as metaphors for for ourselves. Yeah. I, I think it's sort of inherent that people go out to buy a new car and they're looking for something that reflects what they want to be or who they are. <coughs> and, and it might not mat, match everything, but it might be close. Yeah. And um, then people that uh, are hot rodders or people who customize cars, they're actually taking more control of the situation. They're, they're making a complete reflection of who they are on this steel object. 
and all the things that it signifies down, you know, from the curves of the fender or kind of wheels you use, all of those things mean something in a kind of uh, a metaphorical vocabulary. So. Yes. And so you you get into your, let's, let me think about a little time period when I was particularly interested in uh, uh, meditation driving with my Datsun 2000 Roadster and driving up Highway 18 to Lake Arrowhead playing uh, a, a Soft Machine Third album and uh, understanding that there was some relationship between the driving, the feel of the steering wheel in your hand, the way the tires were hitting the pavement and the music, the beat, sound of the engine, all those things orchestrated themselves. Uh, and that was probably the closest I got to Satori. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, in Japan there's a great tradition of walking meditation, it's just upgraded and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and with a larger vehicle. You know, I thought you were going to say that cars are vehicles for the self. If I were to come up with a title that would work for probably any of your exhibitions, it would be greater and less a vehicle. <laughs> Customized with Buddha, right? Right, yeah, top rod and Buddha. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> super Buddha. Mm -hmm. um, but the, as you were saying a minute ago, the point of the customizing is that we're not passive. That's good. Right, right. You take, you're trying to take control of, of, of all those situations. Oh. You're trying to be there. You're not absorbing what corporate America is giving you, but you're actually trying to somehow influence it back. Make it your own, being a vehicle uh, unto yourself. <laughs> so, and I think you, I mean, you've even done things such as uh, create a Vermeer tableau out of a Pontiac Grand Prix, is that right? That's right. Um, right. Arrange cars in Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. That's right. <laughs> as, if, as if cars were units of currency. Oh, sure. And they were all there also, they can represent people, uh, as in the Last Supper piece. Uh, I worked off of the Da Vinci painting for colors, mm -hmm. and uh, basically all the cars in the tableau, they're model cars, not real cars. I, it was, in a way, a kind of dress rehearsal for doing a gigantic, kind of all of Santa Fe, New Mexico, last supper of cars, because they do that with, um, with low riders. Uh, but the idea was that uh, uh, all the apostles and Jesus drive General Motors cars. <laughs> hidden in there is a Ford. <laughs> but he's, he's, he's got the most powerful engine. <laughs> so his, his, uh, his, the, 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 the inflection of that is that, that he, he believes unto himself that he has a certain amount of power over Jesus in the situation. So that, that idea of hidden power inside of the engine compartment is part of the piece, but it's not readily visible. Mm -hmm. I wish I could get a uh, four of those pieces of silver. <laughs> <laughs> you are, among other things, you are 54 with DeSoto, right? Right, the DeSotos were an uh, auto automobile, 1928 to 1961. Yes. Or, which was a, you know, a great source of humor to my uh, childhood friends. <laughs> uh, my father never owned a DeSoto. He just thought it was, I, I guess he thought it was uh, redundant or something. <laughs> but uh, the, the, the symbol, the trademark of DeSoto is the conquistador head. Yes. So uh, uh, one of the, I, I think one of the, the uh, one of the strange things about how DeSotos were marketed in the 1950s were that they were uh, friendly for women because they had swivel seats. So you open the door, the seat would swivel out and you could sit on it and then swivel in. You know, uh, getting yourself um, in a situation where, where you would be, uh, I don't know, what, what was the word? I can't think of the word right now, but um, where you would, you would reveal more than you needed to. So, uh, uh, but if you study the history of Fernando de Soto, you know that he was a serial rapist, <laughs> that, he, uh, um, that he destroyed the Peruvian Empire, the, 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 the god of the sun god, with uh, uh, a very uh, amazing uh, adventure where he came to Peru with 156 men, 
and uh, he rode into a valley where the sun, the sun god was vacationing uh, in a gigantic tent surrounded by a hundred thousand soldiers. Yeah. And he rode in on his horses, as nobody had seen before. He had a white horse that could do equestrian tricks. He demonstrated to the sun god, and the sun god says, you're a cool dude. I'm going to give you one of my villas up on the hill. Please, be my guest. And so he and his men went up to this villa, and they invited him for dinner and kidnapped him. And uh, they then ransomed him for gold, as much gold as um, could fill up a giant room that Sun God had marked with a piece of charcoal. He said, if, if, will you let me go if I give you enough gold to fill up this room? And he said, yes, we'll let you go. So he ordered all of the gold, basically almost all the cultural artifacts of this empire to be delivered to DeSoto. And uh, 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 as soon as it was filled with gold, they murdered him and took over the uh, Indian Empire. He became the governor uh, of a great city in the south. But um, he came to the United States, to the southeast, the southern um, uh, United States area, uh, in search of hoping to do it again. He was the governor of Cuba, and uh, he immediately got lost. Uh, the pigs got away. Uh, soldiers were murdered, and he eventually got in a hand-to-hand -hand fight with Tecumseh, the chief uh, in Tennessee, and was wounded and died of sepsis. And um, along the way, he became so feared that the soldiers decided to lie about him being dead. And so they uh, hollowed out a log, and they threw the log into the Mississippi River and told everyone he was still alive so they could get the hell out of there. <laughs> and they eventually got back to Cuba. Uh, so uh, my father's side of the family is Native American. My, my great-great-grandfather came from southeast Spain, the same area that Fernando came from, and married a, a Native woman in Southern California. Uh, so I have the name DeSoto. It's sort of ironically perverse, I think. Um, <laughs> And so the sculpture that I made, the DeSoto Conquest, sort of takes all those stories and puts them together. Uh, it's a 1965 DeSoto, which was never actually made. Uh, the, the company was, um, was dissolved in 1961. So I wanted to make a, a, a kind of a unicorn, something that everyone would see. And say, a lot of people still see it on the street, and they'll say, my dad had one of those. And I'll say, you OK? <laughs> uh, and I'll tell them what year it is, and they'll say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and then other people will look at it and go, wait a minute, this is totally wrong. And uh, the idea is that it's somehow infiltrated into our world, into our streets, and so on, and it still exists as a car, I can still get groceries in it, I can put it in a museum, and it, it serves all these different functions as kind of infiltration piece. And as an artwork. So, mm. And of course, ironically, one of the places where the Soto still flourishes and judges down the street is Cuba. I mean, I didn't bring this as a prop, but this happens to be a picture of Cuba, and if you're walking down the streets of Havana, right. mm -hmm. that's where the 1954 56 DeSoto is still alive and well. Well, there's also a DeSoto club, you know, which just preserves as many DeSotos as they can. Mm. But really, what I think what you're saying just now was that the Empire was playing out, or the Battle of Empire was playing out inside itself. I mean, that you can see that struggle from both sides because you're part of the center and part of the Right, it's, a, it's an internal battle for, uh, uh, you know, would be a, 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 a kind of identity. You know, so it's, it's convenient sometimes to be Native American, sometimes it's not. Yes. Uh, so uh, it's uh, among my uh, Native friends who live on the res, uh, I'm not Indian enough, and uh, you know, to uh, some Hispanic folks, I may not be, you know, Spanish enough or Hispanic enough. Oh. So it's, it falls in between all of these different uh, different ways of uh, perceiving this. Which is it's the way it's there. This is the land of the hybrid, and I'm not referring just to the <laughs> reasons, but uh, 
we're all about in that situation. And I think it goes back to what you were saying about when you see the goblet choosing her. Mm -hmm. Look at it. And, you know, I found I was just saying to somebody uh, the advantage of having many different nationalities and being able to play the card. So as soon as I show up in England, and they say, where did you come from? I say, I'm from California. Say, oh, wonderful. And MSV from the Youth Revolution and the land of possibility. Right? And I come back here. They say, where are you from? Oh, you know, Oxford, England. Ah, Downton Abbey has come to my <laughs> So I'm sure there are times when you know how to be an Asian American or to be a Spanish. Sometimes I don't get that right, though. You choose the wrong one? Yeah, I choose the wrong one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But in Buddhist practice about seeing opportunity where others see crisis. <laughs> uh, and actually, I mean, part of what your work reminds us of is what's in the name. We think what's in the name and we say, I think our names are arbitrary. But there's a whole history to be unpacked. And just before this event, I got the chance to meet uh, Lewis's uh, wife, I believe. She's who's there. Entirely, um, she's entirely Italian and she has this lovely name I associate with in India, Chandra. And of course, I am entirely Indian, and I have an entirely Italian name. <laughs> and uh, I remember when I was a little kid, I, I was always grateful to my parents for giving me this name perfect for my global identity, because it could fit in any culture. In Japan, it's the name you use for little pet birds, like Tweety or something. <laughs> Spanish or Portuguese or any other thing. And then only much later did I realize that my full name is Siddharth Biko Raghavan Aya. So my first name is actually the name of the Buddha. My second name is a great Catholic renegade from the Renaissance. My third name is my father's, he was a theosophist. My fourth name is a very typical um, Hindu priest's name. And so all these religions are there in one. And my parents were wiser than they knew, and I was <laughs> luckier than I knew to have those. Um, and, and do you have, do you have a Kahula name? Or? I do not. Oh. I do not. And you never really lived in a Kakwila community? Uh, the, uh, my father lived on the uh, two Kuya reservations. Um, he uh, grew up on the Saboba reservation, which is on the west side of the San Jose Mountains. And there was a flash flood where, um, kind of an apocryphal story, where my, my grandmother had to carry him over her head as the floodwaters were coming down the mountain. Uh, and after that point, he always had a fear of, of swimming. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, they, since the, the village was destroyed, they went over to the other family side on the, on the east side, which was the, it's known as Palm Canyon. And he grew up in Palm Canyon, which is now kind of a, it's a reservation park mm -hmm. where you can go and drive your car up, get admission, and walk around in there. My father liked to take me down there and you know, point out where their house was. And, where he would play and, uh, and how much fun he had there. And apart from all that, you clearly grew up with um, that mythology, that vision in your head. Sure, yeah. It affects the way you see things. Right? Yeah, with, yeah his, his overbiting nostalgia sort of tweaked me. Hmm. And did his or his ancestors' way of apprehending the world come down to you? To him or not? I, I think that uh, what happened was more that I decided to study it. Yeah. So, uh, as a person who cared about it, a comparative religion as a way of, uh, of study, I then started looking at the cosmological stories from that area, and those were fascinating. Uh, and it made me realize sometime in the mid-80s that the way we use the Earth is really related to the way we, where we think the Earth came from. So if we think about it Old Testament style, Earth was created a number of days, uh, man was given dominion over nature, and uh, uh, we have this tendency to think that nature has no consequence for us. We, we control it, we can do what we want with it. Uh, uh, global warming or climate change doesn't really exist. Uh, we're not really doing these things. These things are just happening. Um, and then uh, uh, just different ways of looking at uh, the valley, for instance. If we think about San Bernardino, I did a project called Tapa Tapa, which means Hill of the Ravens. Mm. It's uh, a little mountain in the middle of the valley. Uh, and uh, the ravens were thought as a kind of a, a messenger between the human world and the world of supernatural power, powerful, powerful beings. The, uh, uh, 
the little mountain was renamed uh, Sorito Solo, like a little mountain by itself, a little lonely mountain. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, it's a very, uh, uh, it's an interesting term because it, it specifies that there's a certain separation between it and the valley that's surrounding it. So instead of, you know, it's an alienation image, uh, which you could say could go back to the to that Old Testament way of thinking about the world. And then it was named Marble Mountain because there was limestone in the middle of it and they started mining that limestone. So then it became about how we use the mountain. And then finally it was named Slover, Mount Slover, for a guy that owned some property at the base of it who was killed by a grizzly bear. So then we started naming the world for people. You know, and recently Denali was returned to its original name, which was not been before. Uh, was named for some guy who had never been there, right? Uh, and so the idea that we can name the world for people sort of displaces the identity of the place itself. Well, I loved what you were saying a minute ago about the raven, too, because to me, so much of your work is about the human world and some, something else. I mean, this piece, there you are, there's your face, but it's with the Buddha, and it's with these notions of transcendence. And, and when you were talking about the cars, there's something super everyday, but you're saying, well, there actually can be vehicles or something beyond that. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, and I think I read, probably in connection with your work, that in the Kahuila language, there's no word for sacred, everything. Right. Well, the, the, there is a word that uh, you can apply to anything, which is power. And uh, everything has power. Uh, so it's easy to say that, well, uh, electricity is power, and a uh, rock has power, and an, and an animal has power, and all, of, all those powers have uh, their own kind of identity. So uh, there, is, there is nothing that's not interconnected with power. Not so different from Buddhism. No, not so different. Uh, there's one electrical current. Right, yes. right, exactly. Um, and you just recently, earlier this year, you brought out this book, which I'm really envious about, because for somebody who doesn't write full time, it's so aromatic and evocative, but really about mm -hmm. your growing up in um, San Bernardino and Riverside and those areas. And one thing I loved about it, it's called Empire, but it's nothing like Imperial Rome. I mean, this is the Inland Empire, which we don't usually think about. Right, right. The word empire is so, uh, uh, it's such a vast thing. But uh, when you think about how many square miles there are in the so-called Inland Empire, it's bigger than most states in the United States. So yeah. there is an empire there, but it's a kind of invisible empire covered over with uh, dust and Kmarts. <laughs> you call it an empire of smog, I think, at one point. Yeah, an empire of smog, an empire of freeways. Empire of nothingness sometimes, an empire of emptiness. Right. Um, but it's a, it's a wonderful tonic vision of California, because it's, it's almost as if it's a complete vision at times, because it's an insider's view of this place that most of us just drive through. I've never thought to open my eyes. It's, uh, yeah, when you do, it's sort of a harsh reality, particularly uh, in San Bernardino, which is a, it's a bankrupt city. It used to be a, it used to be a self-contained, uh, vibrant city that had a lot of diversity, even from the 40s. So, um, I remember my mother telling me that um, when the Japanese were sent to internment camps, the Japanese handed over their titles of their property to the Hispanic community and was returned to them when they returned to San Bernardino, the property was returned to them. Um, so there were these, she said there were these, these, like somebody would write a deed to their property the day before they were being shipped out. Yeah. Uh, and my, uh, I was delivered uh, at St. Bernie's Hospital by a Chinese doctor. Uh -huh. My dentist was Japanese. Uh -huh. there was, there's always this diversity there that, um, that I kind of took for granted. Uh, and now we associate, you know, we see in the same sentence, San Bernardino, Paris, <laughs> right? Because of the terrorist attacks. Um, yeah. Yeah. But uh, there's, a, there's a lot going on there. It's pretty interesting. Um, and then to the south is Riverside County, which is uh, a richer, more, uh, I don't know you call it elitist, I suppose, but uh, it has a, a kind of a 
academic depth and uh, a sense of preserving its history that San Bernardino does not. The San Bernardino, the city fathers have destroyed an enormous amount of the historical buildings in the city and left it with empty big box stores. So uh, it's kind of a tragedy in that way. I sense, I mean, a lot of love in, in the eye that you bring to these places, because they're the places where you grew up and they're where you first fell in love, where you read Dogen Zenji. And sure, Zenji. yeah, Dogen Zenji and San Bernardino. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> another <laughs> book. Next yeah, exactly. <laughs> What moved you to, I think you went back relatively recently, in the last couple of years, and started taking these images. Right. Places. What, right. What's the story about that? Uh, well, uh, my mother uh, was starting to succumb to dementia. Uh, my sister lived with my mother, so she cushioned a lot of that experience for me. But there were things that neither my sister nor my mother could take care of. Sort of like, generally, like fix things in the house. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, uh, get a hold of a plumber and be there when they come because they didn't know what to tell them. Uh, and in order for you not to fall into a deep depression by going back to my, my family house and um, seeing in a sense how my mother who's, my mother was very different from my father in that she needed a strict routine and the routine had to remain the same and my sister falls suit, so I would go back to the same thing, but of course it can't be the same, it's actually falling apart little by little. So it's like the same thing, but worse every time I would go back. So I, I would have to stay in a hotel, otherwise I would lose it. And the idea at that time is I, I also need to make art to make this, uh, this time period worth uh, worth it to, to grow in a way that felt like I wasn't falling into the past. Um, but <coughs> sort of ironically, I wound up writing about the past. Yeah. And that sort of brings me to this thing we were talking about in the break room. Um, uh, if that's okay, we can talk yes. about that. Yeah. Yes. Um, I realized when I was writing about the past that it was so transcendently beautiful. Mm. Uh, it didn't matter what it was about. It could be a terrible thing that happened, or a boring thing that happened, but I gave it my mind and thought about what happened and described it. It was beautiful. And I realized that what was not beautiful was at the time of me experiencing it, my experience was one of my jumbled mind. Right? My, me worrying about, you know, my grade, or me worrying about whether my hair was straight or whatever it might be yeah. at that moment. If I was, you know, uh, if I was strong enough, if I felt weak, or all these sorts of judgments that are self-related. Self and it creates a cloud in my immediate experience. But there's also a part of me that registered it and that remembered it, and I could see it as a transcendently beautiful thing. And so I realized my mind gets in the way of my own experience, but luckily, by remembering it, there's another part of my brain that actually remembers it for what it was. Yeah, you know? yeah it's, I mean, as Van Morrison would say, you've cleaned your windows, kind of. It's not getting <laughs> transparency. It's a windshield And it's such a, that's such a Buddha perspective. I was just thinking this morning how you probably noticed that when you set foot in a temple in Kyoto, it says, look beneath your feet, meaning, Everything you look for is right here. You're looking for heaven, paradise, etc. right here, right now. <coughs> and our tendency is often to look up. Mm -hmm. But actually the looking down experience is, is a kind of liberation in some ways because paradise is not in the future. It's in, this, in your case, it's in the past, but it's also in the present as you went back to the place of the It's like time. a continually, it's like a, 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 it's basically uh, uh, just recalling paradise. Yeah, at every moment. And the recollection is a moment of paradise, right. too. Exactly. Because, because you could only appreciate that voice of paradise when you went back not two years ago, when you were 16. It was sure. confusion and poetry. Right, right, exactly. Shame, whatever I might have been. Yeah. Yeah. So will you, will you continue going through other stages in your life, taking your camera? And well, I have this idea that uh, the book sort of, it doesn't really end with any time period specifically. So the book, uh, the book is not necessarily uh, 
a, uh, uh, a recollection in order of the year as it unfolds, but instead it's a recollection about places. Mm -hmm. So I may have stood in the same place three or four different times at different ages, and I can kind of think about that and also think about, well, how did that place get there in the first place? How, how was that building built? Mm -hmm. what, why is the road there? Yes. Those things that I didn't know at the time, yeah. so I can go back and, and, and research that stuff. So I'm thinking about my last days in the Inland Empire before I moved to Seattle. I was working in Los Angeles. I was working um, as a teacher at Otis Art Institute. Uh, and I got a job, a full-time job in the arts in Seattle. And um, uh, my girlfriend at the time and I moved from our house in Riverside to Seattle and I began my job there. And uh, my years in Seattle were uh, characterized as uh, unending misery. <laughs> so uh, there, there were things that I, I knew when I left I wasn't ready to leave. Uh, yet I knew I had to leave. Um, and uh, I was unaware of how the change of climate would affect my mood. <laughs> So there was this um, unending grayness, which uh, kind of ate away at my uh, vitality. And uh, at the same time, a lot of stuff happened. So I want to go back and actually go to some of these places and, reef and photograph them. I never photographed them because I spent about my first year there getting acclimated in my last three years there trying to figure out how to get out. <laughs> so, uh, the idea of wanting to record that was, uh, was kind of a not in my mind. So I'd like to go back and, and start thinking and looking at these places and allowing the memories that I've, in a sense, suppressed to return to me so that I can, can, can understand them, that I can see the beauty in the place again. You, yeah, I mean, your description of uh, Seattle brought back all kinds of not so pleasant memories in me, too. And it goes back to the, the war of empires within us. Because I was thinking, of course, my Indian blood. India is bright colors, tropical sunshine, energy, and heat. And the England I grew up in is uh, the Seattle of the old world. It's all depressive weather and depressive hearts and minds. And, you know, my writing, like your art, will always be the struggle. I, I, yeah, I did, in 1992 I did a piece where I spent a month in London uh, working on a piece in a building uh, near the Suffolk Bridge. And uh, I, I, I just, I fell into this deep well of depression because it's like, this is Seattle all over again, except I don't understand anyone's English. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it was hard. Yeah, I could say a lot about that, but, but now, <laughs> I think, I'm sure lots of you have questions, and I'm sure many of you have spent time with this piece or other of um, Lewis's work, or my work. So, um, please, if you have questions, we may have a roving mic, but if we don't, we have someone in the front. Yes, we do have a roving mic coming to the front row at the speed of light. Um, I, just for clarification, I was the one that toured the people from D.C. today and was introducing them to your installation. And before I had uh, I'd given your name and was just going in to, to describe what we were looking at, and uh, the man said, is that Louis de Soto's face? Because I've seen it in your lecture. So it wasn't a piece of your art, it was you. So. <laughs> he recognized you in that, and I thought that was fabulous. That's <laughs> clarifying. I'm not sure I'm fast enough to have this job. <laughs> I just realized I'm a 1991 Toyota truck with a camper on it. <laughs> <laughs> that was my guess. <laughs> I was just wondering if when the museum opens, do they inflate in front of the public, or is it inflated before the museum opens? It's inflated uh, for the public. <coughs> I think 11, 10 most mornings, I was told, uh -huh. to see it come to life. I'm beginning to feel like it might be a good idea for us to let people know these things in case you want to make a pilgrimage, so we'll, we'll do that. Would you want to pass it?
you have a seat, Groundhog Day. <laughs> I've seen it over and over again. <laughs> It's my wife's birthday, actually. <laughs> um, I just wondered if, if Trump has one of those dolls. <laughs> and and, and in that regard, um, we've talked a lot about figures, and one of the figures that's rather important in the history of the United States is uh, the Statue of Liberty. And she's been in the harbor, and she's in there, and she's got a torch. And in a sense, you might say she's saying welcome to everyone that appears. Now, can we have a president that is polar opposite of the Statue of Liberty? Are you, are you asking both of us? <laughs> well, my sense is this is a statue of liberation. And obviously, many people would say we liberate ourselves rather than looking to our system to liberate us. shaping, guiding memories of my life right now and come back again and again. And as with dreams, there's a different process of priority and selection involved in the subconscious that one has to attend to because I assume it's wiser than the way I would try and alight on certain dramatic moments of my life and claim they're the big ones because in fact it's the spaces between the notes that probably made the melody of my life. And when uh, Lewis was talking about how he went into an architecture class and found himself listening to philosophy, and I was just remembering how... <laughs> 33 years ago, I was living and working in midtown Manhattan, and I took my first trip ever to Southeast Asia, Thailand, Burma, Hong Kong, and Macau. And each, each of them was far beyond any of my imagining. And each day of that trip, 33 years on, is indelibly impressed in my memory. And when I was flying back from Hong Kong to JFK, I had a layover at uh, Narita Airport near Tokyo. I didn't want it, of course, but that was the way that the itinerary went. And uh, I spent four hours in the airport town of Narita, 
and uh, I moved to Japan on the basis of that. So in other words, I went to four countries, each of which blew my mind for every day of those trips, and it was the layover that has caused me to live in Japan 29 years. And uh, so often, and it's, as with you, you were all set to be Frank Lloyd Wright, and you ended up being Dogen Zenji instead. <laughs> studying, studying in that position. Um, and it's wonderful, so I think when, you know, we're roughly the same age, when you look back on your life, it's like being in Act 4 of the drama as it's reaching its conclusion, and you suddenly see that the, the proportions are utterly different from what you imagined when you were in the thick of it, and these tiny moments 40 years ago are still resonating inside. Um, so memory, I think, selects us in some way. I think there's a thing, too, that we do in dialogue with other people when we talk about what happened to us, we tend to want to model it into a narrative style that we relate to, like in, on stage or plays or movies. And we often say, you know, something significant happens, this is like a movie. Yeah. So uh, the, the idea is that actually the movie is trying very hard to match that feeling we have of some magnificent thing happening at that moment. And so they have to do with music, yeah. where there's no music in our life except <laughs> on our radios. So the um, the idea of making a memory in terms of talking about to other people, I think that we can dramatize it. But there's two ways of thinking about this. One is theater, and one is drama. Theater is scripted, and so therefore we have to think about what we're going to say before, or we have to, you know, uh, manage the speech before, like the one we're going to give when I tell my dad I'm moving out, or whatever it might be. Uh, or I would tell my girlfriend that I love her and I want to marry her. So you, you script that, you make it into theater. Or drama is things that just happen, and you react to them. So there's the dramatic and the theatrical, and I think that memories can be theatrical when you tell them, but they're only modeled after, after ways in which we tell stories. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes they just come out much more awkwardly in terms of real life. So they don't, they don't yes. come out that way. I was just doing a long piece on the great filmmaker Terence Malick, and of course what he's about is rescuing memory from storytelling, just as you're saying, and to say that it's the stray moments on the periphery of our vision that are really the important ones. So that's aggravating for his, um, his actors, but it's liberating for the viewers because it's exactly the non-highlights. Right, exactly, yeah, the in-between spaces. Yeah. Okay, I can see a couple of, I can see a hand here and a hand there. I really like the way you think or your thought process because your image of the truck at sunset being projected and writ large across the, the, the barren kind of desert landscape somehow transmuting into this large piece um, is, is poetic and, and extraordinary and it's not a linear thinking it's just something that's stored up I think and then, and then fuels um, the process in a strange and mysterious way, perhaps. But I'm wondering how you feel about this solitary object in that relatively empty room versus the Missing Peace show, where it was in and among so many other pieces. Well, let's see. Uh, the, uh, the Missing Peace show is about uh, community of culture, and its relationship to the Dalai Lama and to Buddhism and to Buddhism's uh, uh, approach to solving problems in our daily lives or even politically. Uh, and this piece is really, when it's separated out like this, I think it becomes uh, more internally reflective. So and it allows, I think, other people to uh, reflect upon themselves about this idea of, of how we might meet our demise or our transformation into some other form of energy. So uh, I think that they, they uh, the piece itself when it was in the community with the other uh, the other pieces, there was the woman, I can't remember her name right off the top of my head, who did the videos of her laying in the street, for instance, like the Par Nirvana, mm -hmm. where all this activity is going on around her. Uh, you know, bringing Buddha consciousness to the world and demonstrating it in 
engage in front of others. So that's um, that part of the community. I think is important uh, in a completely different way than the way it's the way it comes out here, the way it um, professes itself. Although it's not all gone, it's just it's, it adds to the to the fabric of how you see the piece. Of course, one nice thing right now is this is surrounded by the Pujo and Piety um, <coughs> exhibition that's full of sutras and mm -hmm. mandalas and more friends. Yes, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, this will be the last question. Did that right? Sure. I've got to see the torch. <laughs> so, just this is not my question, but were you in Seattle when the coffee thing was going on? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that didn't help. Okay. Just one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and the uh, library by, by Rem Coolhouse is an amazing. Right. Yes. Yeah, so that that didn't exist when I was there. Okay. And he's the one who should have been in the architecture and philosophy. <laughs> so I feel a little bit like I missed this part of the lecture by asking this this question. But generally speaking, something that's inflated is a cheap thing, right? It's sort of a wrath or a dunk or something. Mm -hmm. And here you have this beautiful spiritual object. Um, how did how did you end up merging those two things? And the, and the second question. Um, was since you're both very spiritual seekers and doers, um, what's the opposite of spirituality? If there is such a thing. Well, yeah, I've never used the word spiritual for me, and nobody else has before you. Yeah, I think um, so. Yeah, no one's ever used that word for me. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's no difference between you know, real life and spirit. You know? I, I think I would go back to the idea of the, the Kamiya notion of power. Everything has power, so. Uh, that kind of merges with that idea. I don't know what the idea of spirit. There's the notion of spirit in in, in Kuwait literature and mythology is is that um, some some people when they die they, they 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 kind of live on, and then some other people merge, sort of depending on their desires. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they want to they want to they want to go into the mountain. They go to the mountain. They go into the sun. They disappear. Or they want to go back to their families. They go search for their families. So it's sort of like this. This uh, it's a it's a it's a personal choice. Um, and I think I mean you get the question was you, but I just want to say that in some ways this piece is the answer to this, that question. I think because it's not spiritual and it's not about cheap inside. It's saying kind of yeah. Yeah, I, th I uh, one of the um, one of the ideas about the inflatable is that well I actually you know my real desire was to be on top of a car dealership as a girl. And that didn't work out. So. <laughs> but uh, there is a certain amount of humor in my work if you look over the work I've done over the years. Uh, there's uh, There's got to be something funny about it or I don't do it. Uh, the car is sort of funny, even though it's about serious things. The Buddha, the, the kind of uh, the idea of it being inflatable and being spiritual, that's sort of funny to me, but at the same time, it, it suggests that as all things in Buddha nature, they do, it doesn't matter if it's inflatable or if it's uh, uh, cheap plastic uh, or if it's 24 karat gold, it's got the same quality to it in, 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 in essence. So. Um, but uh, I do like to do stuff that sort of amuses me in a humorous way. So that amused me to think about doing it that way. Uh, at the same time, it's also, uh, I think I mentioned before, that somatic experience of death is not available to us. So it essentially is a kind of an empty set in our minds. So it remains empty as a big empty space inside. I want to thank you both for filling our afternoon with some exceptional conversation. And I want to invite those of you who can remain um, to join us for a, a small reception, although this crowd obviously would get larger than we would like, to continue the conversation amongst ourselves and perhaps 
with our guests. Um, I know some of you brought books, and I think they could be perhaps persuaded to sign them. Um, but most of all, I want to thank all of you for being here, and most especially to thank the two of you who, despite the fact that this is your first actual physical meeting, I think have allowed us to eavesdrop and participate in a very intimate, wide-ranging, and thoughtful conversation. So thank you so much.